Hello guys, welcome to another lecture. Um, in our previous lecture, we learned about basic concepts of a government. So this lecture, we are gonna learn about the founding of a new nation, how we got to where we are today. So this is what our lecture is going to be like. Government from the 17th century through the 1760s. The political structure is that government of the colonies up through the early 1760s were parallel to those of England during the same period. Royal governors served as substitutes for the king in each individual colony. The governor's council in each colony served as many House of Lords with the most influential men in the colonies serving effectively as a high court and the general assembly in each colony was elected directly by in, by qualified voters in each colony and served essentially as a house of commons passing ordinances and regulations that would govern the colony The Declaration of Independence is a document that the committee submitted its draft to Congress on July 2nd, 1776, after making changes. Congress formally adopted the document on July 4th, 1776. The Declaration of Independence restated John Locke's theory of natural rights the social and the social contract between government and the governed. Um, previously in our lecture, I informed you that Locke argued that although citizens sacrifice certain rights when consent to be governed as part of a social contract, they retain other inalienable rights when they consent to be governed as part of a social contract. This theory is reinforced with Jefferson's quote in the Declaration of Independence. Um, and just a couple fast facts. Uh, Thomas Jefferson was a young lawyer at the time that he wrote the Declaration of Independence. He was 32 years old. Um, and when Jefferson wrote the Declaration of Independence, it, would, it is considered a secular document, which means it had nothing to do with religion because Jefferson feared people would interpret the word God, mean the God of the Bible. He used generic words such as nature's God, creators, and supreme judge. Um, Thomas Jefferson did draft the Virginia Statue of Religious Freedom in 1786, which is a statement about both freedom and conscience and the principle of separation of church and state. Jefferson was the forerunner of religious freedom and um, in that regard. Here is an excerpt of the Declaration of Independence where it says, we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by the creator with certain unalienable rights that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. In Jefferson's first draft, he wrote that people were fundamentally equal regardless of race too, but colonial leaders from the South cut this from the final version, uh, obviously so, because you know the Southern states wanted to keep uh, slavery um, because they had a lot of crops that they were planting. That here's another excerpt of the Declaration of Independence that to secure these rights, governments are instituted among men, deriving their just powers from the consent of the governed. That whenever any form of government becomes destructive to these ends, it is the right of the people to alter or to abolish it and institute new government, laying its foundation on such principles and organizing its powers in such form as to them shall seem most likely to affect their safety and happiness. Uh, the Declaration of Independence is the embodiment of the American Revolution where they would have to fight 
for their independence. The Articles of Confederation was the world's first written constitution that clearly outlined the rights, duties, and powers of the government and the people. The colonists needed some type of government, so the Second Continental Congress drafted the Articles of Confederation. The document wasn't formally ratified by all 13 colonies until, until 1781. Uh, it created a league of friendship among the states, but the states remained sovereign and independent with the power and authority to govern the colonies. The sole body of the government rested in Congress where each state had one vote. There were some weaknesses of the Articles of Confederation. Congress had trouble passing laws because a vote of 9 out of 13 states were needed. Number two, there was no executive official to ensure that laws were carried out. Three, without national courts, there were no means of interpreting laws or carrying out justice. Four, the Articles of Confederation could not be changed without a unanimous vote. Five, Congress lacked power to collect taxes. Six, the government could not control between states. Seven, each state had its own currency, so there was no stable national currency. And lastly, number eight, the government could not pay its debts. The Annapolis Convention was held in September, from September 11th through the 14th in 17. 86. Now, this is a very significant meeting um, and is formally known as Meeting of Commissioner to Remedy Defects of the Federal Government. Uh, during the Annapolis Convention held in Annapolis, Maryland, Hamilton called for a meeting in Philadelphia stating that to render the Constitution of the Federal Government adequate for the exigencies of the Union. Hamilton wanted to address the issues of the Articles the Confederation had, and this meeting started the Constitutional Convention uh, to write the United States Constitution. Um, and like I said, there's a QR code, and you can actually scan that code to get the actual text of what took place during that convention. Um, there were other delegates that attended this convention. They included New York, New Jersey, Pennsylvania, Delaware, and Virginia, and they all met in Annapolis, Maryland. Um, and certainly the goal was to take into consideration the situation of the United States to devise such further provisions as shall appear to them necessary to render the Constitution of the federal government adequate to the exigencies of the Union um, as I quote. Now, um, Shea's Rebellion was a rebellion sparked because of inflation rates. Uh, Massachusetts had levied high poll and land taxes to pay off a massive war debt where the tax burden was on the shoulders of the farmers and the poor. The legislatures had adjourned without providing paper money or any other relief from taxes and debts. The farmers were very, and the farmers were very upset. Um, in reaction, the farmers held town meetings and demanded relief. The farmer or the person that led this revolt or rebellion was Daniel Shays. He was a Massachusetts farmer and he had about 1,200 other men behind him trying to get relief. Um, in reaction, the farmers held town hall meetings and demanded relief, so they were very diplomatic at first. Um, and then they kind of took their took their weapons and they, they wanted justice, they wanted relief, they wanted help. Um, in result, uh, four men had died in result of the incident, and the rebels had a slight victory. Um, the legislature decided to address the agricultural crisis 
by eliminating some taxes on farmers. Now, who is Cap who is Daniel Shays? Well, Daniel Shays was a captain um, and a war veteran, and he was also a farmer who advanced upon the federal arsenal at Springfield in 1787. Uh, Shays really wanted more flexible monetary policy, two laws allowing them to use corn and wheat as money, and three the right to postpone paying taxes until the post had agricultural uh, until the agricultural depression was lifted. So now we're going to talk about the Constitutional Co Convention and what took place at that time. So let's get into that right now. So first I just want to kind of go over a brief summary of the Constitutional Convention and then we'll get into some of the nitty gritty details of what occurred during that convention. So obviously there was there were concerns of the founding father fathers uh, from the time of the ratification of the Articles of Confederation to now resulting in actually ratifying um, the formal document of our government. So number one, the United States was being treated being treated with contempt by other nations and foreign trade has suffered as a consequence. Number two, the economic radicalism of Shays Rebellion might spread in the absence of stronger central government. Number three, the Native Americans had responded to encroachment on their lands by threatening frontiersmen and land speculators and the national government had been ill-equipped to provide citizens with protection. And lastly, number four, the post-war economic depression had worsened and the national government was powerless to take any action to address it. Now, during the Constitutional Convention, there were certain plans and compromises that were proposed during that time. Um, some of these plans and proposals were eliminated um, several years later, and some of these plans and compromises are what we see going on in our government today. So we will get into those right now. So the very first plan was the Virginia Plan. Uh, the Virginia Plan was presented on May 29, 1787 by Edmund Randolph. Um, the plan called for a separate legislative, executive, and judicial branches and a truly national government whose laws would be binding upon individual citizens as well as states. Congress will be divided into two states, a lower house to be chosen by popular vote and an upper house of, of senators elected by the state legislators. Those that were critical of the Virginia plan proposed the New Jersey plan as an alternative. So you can think of the Virginia plan as the big state plan. Um, to see what the Virginia plan looked like and how it was proposed, you can actually take a look at the the actual text of the Virginia plan who was in concurrence of the plan and who was not um, you can certainly look at that by scanning the QR code and you can actually get the notes of James Madison um, during the time that the Virginia plan was actually proposed All right, so the next plan is in the New Jersey plan, or what I like to call the small state plan. Um, this was presented on June 15th by William Patterson and other delegates. Uh, this plan would retain the Articles of Confederation principle of a legislature where states enjoyed equal representation, um, a unicameral legislature elected by the people, unicameral meaning one house, and plural executives chosen by the legislature, and Congress has power to tax and regulate Congress. 
Um, and you can actually, once again, you can take a look uh, at the actual text or notes of James Madison during the Constitutional Convention, and you can see uh, the delegates arguing um, for or against uh, for the New Jersey plan. Uh, now, both the Virginia and the New Jersey plans rejected a model of government in which the executive will be given extensive authority. So although New, the, both New Jersey plan and the Virginia plan, um, they had an issue with representation, um, but they, however, they both agree that um, the executive branch shouldn't have too much power. All right, so the next compromise was the Great Connecticut Compromise. Um, this one was actually presented on July 16th by Roger Sherman, um, which he proposed the following. One, a bicameral two-house legislature with an upper house or senate in which the states would have equal power with two representatives from each state and a lower House of Representatives, which members would membership would be apportioned on the basis of population. The guarantee and two, the guarantee that all revenue bills will originate in the lower house. Um, the compromise resolved the disagreement over the nature of the executive. So you know, obviously the this compromise is solved actually all the issues that both the legislature that the Virginia plan and the New Jersey plan had um, and it actually kind of met both of the demands of, of both the Virginia and the New Jersey plan um, now just a quick tidbit um, and you can actually scan the QR code here in the corner as well just to see once again James Madison's notes during the debate of the Great Connecticut Compromise. Um, and you'll read that um, the Great Compromise was actually approved on a 5-4 vote. So Connecticut, New Jersey, South Carolina, Delaware, Maryland, and North Carolina approved, while Pennsylvania, Virginia, South Carolina, and Georgia opposed, and New York and New Hampshire were absent. They weren't there, and Massachusetts was actually deadlocked. Now, this, I wouldn't call it famous, but it is the infamous three-fifths compromise, um, and it was proposed, and it had to deal with the issue of slavery, because um, obviously slavery was a huge issue at the time, um, and it carried on for a little while after that, but um, the three-fifths compromise was actually proposed on July 11th by James Wilson and Roger Sherman. Uh, the compromise proposed that five slaves will be counted as the equivalent of three people for purposes of taxes and representation. Once again, I have the QR code uh, for you to scan to actually read the actual debate that went on uh, for the three-fifths compromise. Um, and you can see the debate that's going on, this cycle of Slavery, no slavery, property, no property, taxes, no taxes. Um, so I highly recommend that you read uh, the actual three-fifths compromise and what the delegates were debating and why they were why they said said or said what they said. Now, obviously, the delegates from southern states also feared that a Congress dominated by representatives from more populous northern states might take action against the slave trade. Most northerners continued to favor gradual emancipation. Um, in 1807, the sale population, uh, population steadily outgrew demand. Many southerners allied with opponents of the slave trade to ban the importation of slaves. It wasn't until the Civil War, obviously, it took a war to end slavery and the ratification of the 13th Amendment to actually uh, end slavery um, that the issue of slavery was actually resolved. Now, as far as the ratifying of the Constitution, now, obviously, the Revolutionary War was over. The war between the United States and Britain was over. 
However, there was a political war going on between the Federalists and the Anti-Federalists. Now, I hope you were able to read the passage. If you weren't able to, I will link it in the description box below, and you can read that. It will give you a detailed uh, differences between the Federalists and the Anti-Federalists. I highly recommend that you uh, read that so you can get a contextual um, understanding of what the Federalists and the Anti-Federalists believed um, in regards to the ratification of the Constitution. Now, the Federalists versus the Anti-Federalists. The Federalists supported the ratification of a new Constitution um, between 1787 to 1789. Alexander Hamilton, John Jay, and James Madison wrote the Federalist Papers in order to get the Constitution ratified. On the other hand, you have the Anti-Federalists who opposed the ratification of a new Constitution. Um, they countered the Federalist Papers by drafting Brutus, and the federal founder, um, and they, in fact, wanted a Bill of Rights in the Constitution. And as you can see here, this is a brief graphic organizer just for you, or infographic, just to give you an understanding of what, who the key federalists and anti federalists were, the overall vision of the two groups, their favorite document, Bill of Rights or no Bill of Rights, and what type or group of people that both of these groups actually supported um, politically. And the Federalist Papers consist of 85 essays written by James Madison, Alexander Hamilton, and John Jay that I have that are pictured here. Um, however, we will not go through all the essays only just a selected few during this class. Um, the Farless Papers is a series of articles authored, as I stated, by Alexander Hamilton, Madison, and John Jay, which argued in favor of ratifying the proposed Constitution of the United States. The Farless Papers outline the philosophy and motiv motivation of the document. Um, they were uh, very well organized, collected, printed, and told the benefits of the Constitution um, and certainly emphasizing the inadequacy of the Articles of Confederation and the need for a stronger government. Um, these essays uh, are considered and still are considered to be classical works of political philosophy. Um, now, this concludes our lecture. Um, our next lecture will focus more on the Constitution, um, going more in depth of the Federalist Papers, and, um, and, and that will be our next week's lecture. Um, I hope you have a wonderful week, and I will see you next week. Bye!